Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. This is 10 inventions that changed electric guitar forever. I was looking at all these guitars one day and I was thinking, man, you know, there's a lot of brands here, a lot of cool guitars, and there's a lot of similarities. And I started wondering like, yeah, I wonder what happens. Like when an invention comes out on electric guitar, does it all of a sudden just become adopted by everyone if it's really good or really bad? And uh, I thought, okay, let's let's look at this. We're gonna start with 1937 and the Rickenbacker frying pan. It's the first credited electric guitar. And of course you can't have a list of things that change electric guitar forever if you don't say where it started. Now. There is a caveat that in 1936, there was an acoustic guitar that had a pickup in it. And that was of course, electrified guitar as well. But uh, the frying pan gets the big credit for being the first kind of like electric guitar. And that leads us to 1949. And of course the Fender Esquire. And that's not only the first solid body electric guitar, it's also a mass produced type of guitar is what it ends up becoming when it comes to Telecaster. And have that obviously absolutely changed the industry forever and guitars as we know it. Um, I mean, how many guitars behind me are solid bodies? Uh, it's the predominant way of making guitars. And of course, not to mention the screwed on necks and uh, just the concept. It's, a, it's obviously changed guitar forever and everybody was following it. The next invention I thought really had an impact in, in the guitar market was in 1957, of course, Seth Lover and Gibson invent the humbucker. I don't know if anything's gonna top this on the list as being so influential and in changing the industry. Without a doubt, most of you watching are gonna have humbuckers over single coils, or even if you even if you have single coils, you're gonna have some kind of variation where it's humbuckers and singles. And of course, it really changed music, it changed guitar, and, it, and again, I think it's an invention that changed the electric guitar forever and uh, made everybody adopt it. Now the next one is 1972 and it's Alembic who invented the 24th fret guitar. They put a 24th fret, 24th fret on a guitar. So you have two full octaves. Now this is again, this is a big thing because looking at guitar, especially modern guitars now, I mean, every company that makes a modern shredding guitar has 24 frets. So this is a big deal. This is literally, literally became the thing. And of course I don't give them credit necessarily for making it a huge, thing. I think companies like Ibanez and Jackson and other companies probably did that later, you know, with the shred thing. And, and but I, I definitely think obviously there's where the credit goes. Now, interesting, same year, 1972, DiMarzio made the Super Distortion. This is huge for two reasons. One, obviously it's the first kind of like pickup that kicks the amp in the throat. In other words, it's, you know, first high output pickup. And that really changes guitar forever because even though so many vintage style guitars exist today with a vintage style pickup, the majority of pickups are more modernized. There's more more pickups, more in the lineage of a modern pickup than the old vintage pickups for sure. And uh, by the construction, by the design, by what it does. But of also, DiMaggio also invented the first basically uh, uh, aftermarket pickup. So this is the first time you know we were able to buy a pickup and insert it into a guitar. And this is so commonplace that actually manufacturers do it now. I mean, they sell their own pickups you know, so that people can put their pickups in another guitar. You can put a Gibson pickup in a Fender if you want, and you can put a Fender pickup in a Paul Reed Smith if you want. So, I mean, that's essentially a huge change to the guitar industry and to guitar electric guitar forever. Now, then we get to 1976 and uh, the Floyd Rose. I know what you're thinking. Well, the Floyd Rose didn't change all guitars because all guitars aren't Floyd Rose. Well, think about this. You have Leo Fender later inventing the two-point Fulcrum Tremolo for GNL, and you see the two-point Tremolo become a thing. But more importantly, not only do you see the Floyd on almost all the 80s guitars, but more importantly, as someone who's working and repairing on guitars, you can see where a lot of the theories behind what he did kind of spread like wildfire through the industry. Most importantly, not even the bridge, but the nut. The locking nut really changed a lot of manufacturers' thought process of what's important on a nut because of the fact that what he was doing was locking the nut so that he can dive bomb and pull up on the bridge. A lot of companies, whether they use lubricated nuts now, all that stuff is really kind of inspired off this idea that it's really important to make sure that when somebody's kind of using that that whammy bar, that the strings return to the exact same spot for for intonation and tuning purposes. So obviously the bridge isn't important, but also just the thought of the bridge. Now, 1977 is not an invention, but it's so important. I think it has to make the list when Hartley Peavy decided to CNC make guitars. And of course, every guitar now is CNC for the most part, every meaning 90 something percent. And it really changed this industry forever. This story goes loosely that uh, Hartley wanted to build some guitars. He was already making amps and He's an avid gun collector and the stocks, the wood stocks on his uh, rifles, I guess, were made by CNC's over in France or in Europe. And uh, so he went there, 
checked out the machine and bought one. And the first day they made 200 bodies and they were like, yeah, this is the way to go. And obviously that forever changed the electric guitar. I mean, it's, it says to me, it's as integral as the 1949 Esquire. Like it's these two things now are how every guitar is done. It's essentially a solid piece of wood CNC'd out with the machine. Next on my list was 1983, The Locking Key by Spurzall. Locking keys are super important to me because I hate restringing guitars. And since I've restringed so many guitars for so many people, uh, man, cutting the restring time in half, it's a no brainer. A lot of people give locking keys credit for keeping guitars in tune. I found that that's not really the case. I mean, obviously they're good tuning keys, so they don't hinder that performance. However, uh, a good tuning key is a good tuning key. I can, you know, you can keep a guitar in tune with any tuning key. However, Having a locking key, of course, like I said, cuts down the, the restring time. And of course, look at this. We know they influence the industry. Look how many guitars not only have locking keys, but almost every manufacturer of tuning keys makes a locking key version. So for sure. Right now is a perfect time to talk about our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. After taking that test, I really saw some areas I could really improve on. Not only was I able to take a class on lighting, I was able to take a class on recording. And one of the things I really enjoyed is that they have the classes set by time. If you have 15 minutes to spare, that was a big deal for me because sometimes I was thinking when I was sitting around going, I got 15 minutes, let's learn something real quick. One of the instructors I really enjoyed was Chris Brooker and I really like how he broke things down, but more importantly, I like that I could go to sections as I was setting up some new recording ideas. The first 1,000 people to use the link down below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. The next one is tough because I can't find the exact year. So it's in the 80s. I don't know if it's actually technically before the lock and key in 83 or slightly uh, after, but it's the compound radius and it was introduced by Warmoth. What's interesting was that was that took a lot of research because I had already always kind of heard it was Grover Jackson and there might be some connections there because of obviously Boogie Bodies, Jackson, Warmoth that time. So, so again, like I said, this is just what you can find, but more importantly to me is the compound radius itself. And a lot of you right now are like, well, I don't use Carol compound radius. I don't think it changed anything. Well, I definitely changed everything because not only do a lot of companies use that now, but a lot of companies put a lot of focus on radius on fretboards now, you know, whether it's 12, it's 16, it's nine and a half. The compound radius was the first kind of, to me was introduction to say, hey, look, the players are looking for that perfect world of, you know, have their cake and eat it too. They want everything. And so that was the first time they got it. This next one, the Relic Guitar. Yeah, introduced at the NAMM show in 1995 by Fender Guitars when they introduced some 50s, 1950s reissue strats that were relic. Whether you like it, whether you love it, it ab absolutely changed electric guitar forever. The idea of beating up guitars before they left the fa factory is so common now <laughs> across all brands. That it's not even just, keep in mind, it's not even just relicking like beating up guitars. Um, for instance, the uh, Paul Reed Smith Silver Skies, they don't relic them, but they do kind of sand and wear the fretboard edges and try to make the neck feel more worn in. So whether you realize it or not, you could be buying guitars where that manufacturer is using a technique of relicking, just not making the guitar look relicked, but making it feel relicked. There's a lot of emphasis on rolled fretboards now. And that's essentially a relicking process. That's something to age the guitar. You're trying to break in the field that the rounded, the uh, rolled fretboards really from people playing them from years. So interesting there as well. Last 1999, which is really, really kind of bummed me out. I was like, I was like really nothing from the 2000s. It really gets pretty thin after this. And I, I could do a longer list, but at 10, we're sticking with 10. 1999, the dual action truss rod. I literally think this was uh, groundbreaking. Um, it's not a credit to a company. It's actually the patents held by two, two individuals. And I could not find what a company they were attached to, if at all. But more importantly, the dual action truss rod, uh, of course, is the thing that I, not only improves the way the necks perform on guitars. And a lot of you could even say, well, what about carbon fiber truss or carbon fiber rods? That's important too. But the dual action truss rod, what I love about it as someone who's worked on guitars for many years is that I love it when manufacturers actually put them in inexpensive guitars because a lot of times with inexpensive guitars, they don't they don't select the best piece of wood for the neck and they don't actually dry it properly. And with a dual action truss rod, you can really get that neck to kind of do what it doesn't want to do, right? That that piece of wood has a, a mind of its own. It wants to do something. And, and, uh, and it used to be like, if you had a single action truss rod, you could make it go straight. But if it 
backbowed, you were you were kind of hosed. And um, now with the dual action truss rod, you can dial it in on a nice guitar. I mean, again, it helps you dial in that guitar perfectly. It makes you feel comfortable knowing that when you go places, if you travel, this uh, this guitar could be adjusted to fix whatever problem comes comes your way. So very, very cool. I mean, obviously the dual action truss rod. Now, lastly, uh, I have some honorable mentions. These aren't really like anything other than just to mention some things that I thought was cool. I think uh, graphite nuts, uh, like by GraphTech and Tusk, um, not saying they invented them, just saying those are cool inventions. I think change guitar. Roasted guitar necks, I think is uh, a cool and roasting is definitely something more modernized. That would be in the 2000s. But again, I couldn't find out who gets accredited with it. Um, really what I saw was some loose banter about maybe it was Sir or maybe it was, you know, Music Man or maybe it was another company. A lot of small builders were accredited with it. So uh, that's the problem with all this kind of stuff. A lot of times I've done this this past and there's always a company that will reach out and say, uh, yeah, Phil, so you know, my grandfather actually did that in his basement and uh, not that company you're saying. So again, this is just what the, the internet is crediting people to it. I thought that I would just do that as a courtesy to mention it, but it's the invention I care about and maybe the time frame, the year it popped into the industry. I hope you enjoyed this list and uh, I thought it was fun to do. As always, guys, thank you so much for your time. Till the next time, know your gear.